the future glory that God has going, that God is going to give us when we arrive at heaven's shores. You see, everything about the kingdom of God is contrary to the world. You've got to know that by now if you've been a believer more than three years or even a year. You've got to understand that everything about God and his kingdom goes contrary to the world. It's total opposites. And these do not attract. Amen? I hope you got that one. Not too many people got it, but really, these are, they don't attract. The kingdom of God is on a higher plane. The kingdom of this world is on a lower level, base. On the mundane things of our society, what our society values, it's not so valuable to God. Now I want you to understand that because it's very important that we understand that in our lives and in our hearts as believers. That we live contrary to the world, but we have a hope. And the Bible says in verse 25 at the end of it, that we wait patiently for that hope. Patiently. Brothers and sisters, everything about God and His work in the lives of His sons and daughters, there's always patience involved in His work in our hearts. We must learn to wait. Contrary to the world, we want it now. Contrary to the world and Frank Sinatra's famous song, I did it my way, right? I don't know if you ever heard Frankie Boy, but he was very famous. He did it his way, and his way ended wrong and bad and void of God. You see, we have to understand what we're talking about here, the contrast, the comparisons that are being made in these verses of having a hope in God, ladies and gentlemen, because the world system is totally opposite from the system of God, from the government of God, and we with patience attain a resurrection from the dead in Christ. That's what we are living for. We're not living for a better tomorrow. We're not living for that. If you became a Christian to have a better tomorrow, that is the wrong Christianity. That is not Christianity. That is not God. That is not the gospel. To make my life better now? What about then? What about in years to come? What if something happens physically to me? What if I get sick and ill and my better days are gone? Where does my hope lie? In just a better day or a better week or a better month? or in a future hope with God. Think for a moment of what is being spoken of here through the Apostle Paul, because this hope is our salvation. This hope is the salvation of your soul. That's what we're talking about. The salvation of the soul of those who have faith in God, for we are saved by hope. We're saved by hope. H-O-P-E. Hope. But we're already saved, aren't we? We have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. We celebrated Christ tonight. We celebrated the broken body, the shed blood. That is our salvation. We are saved and set free. And the Lord has been good to us. But there is a completion to that salvation. And that is when we make it to the other side. We're running a race. That's why the Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning his shame. See, he endured suffering. He endured trials and pains and rejection by men. It says that he was a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering like one from whom men hide their faces. Men hid their faces from Jesus Christ. They didn't want nothing to do with him, although he was paid the penalty for their sins and their wrongdoing. They didn't want anything to do with him, but yet it was for the joy set before him. Notice, the joy was set before him. Before him, what joy? The joy that souls would be saved and go to heaven. That souls through the blood and sacrifice of Christ and resurrection power will have a home in heaven. That's what we're talking about. 
We're saved by that hope. We're saved by that hope. Amen? Amen. You have been saved through Christ. The completion of it is the hope of eternal glory with God, which is about heaven. Therefore, right now, I have an expectation. I don't live just for today. I don't live just for tomorrow or next week to preach a better sermon in the life of a pastor. For you, you don't live for next week. You don't live for those things in the sense of that's all you have. There's more to it. There is coming a day where all this is done and we're in heaven, we're with God. Don't ever forget the words of our master, our Lord. I went to prepare, I go to prepare a place for you. He went to prepare a place for you. Imagine the preparation of God's home for you in comparison to your home. Doesn't match it. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has planned for his children. And so we got to understand that hope is mentioned five times and let us define hope. Let us understand what hope means. Hope in the Greek means properly expectation of what is sure, certain hope. Notice the definition that says sure, certain. It's certain. You know, there's a lot of things that are uncertain in this world. You know, the stock market can crash and we can all lose everything. Just look at Venezuela. And all the people that put their hope in riches. And all that they had without Christ. When that crashes, it's, it's sorrow and a pain that I can't even describe. I remember when the stock market crashed and people on Wall Street, the Wall Street took their lives because they lost everything. Because their hope was only in riches. Their hope was only in financial capital. There's no redemption that I can give for the soul of Jay that will suffice. It is that precious to God, it is that valuable to God, and it's so valuable that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Do you see the hope and what he's done? Do you begin now to have an expectation of heaven? Do, do you begin to now look past the struggles of life, your, your, your dreams, your aspirations, and see a greater gift that God gives that is life eternal? We got to start looking and thinking eternally. We should start thinking that way. Amen? We should start looking and thinking that way because when we begin to look and think that way, the troubles of our lives are minuscule. They're minuscule. When we don't think on things of God in eternity, the troubles of life are big. And we're always focused on the big problems of our lives because we can't see the greatness of our God. We, we forget He's eternal. We forget He's powerful. We forget He's omniscient, omnipotent. Omnipresent. He's right here with us here tonight. You believe that's that is amazing that God is here with us, dealing with us through his word, by his spirit, getting a hold of your heart to serve him and love him all the more. So we have an expectation. By this hope, expectation, by this hope that is certain, God does not lie. God does not change. God said there's hope in Him and therefore I have hope in Him. That doesn't change. I will not be put to shame. You will not be put to shame because you trust the Messiah. You trust God. And God doesn't lie. God said He's going to do it. He's going to take you home. He's going to resurrect your body. He's going to leave the old carcass here and give you a new one. That's grand. That's grand. 
That is the grandeur of our God. This is the hope that Paul is talking to the Romans about. This is the hope that the Spirit of God is talking to us about. Are you certain of it? Are you sure of it? Now let's think. And let's say, no, I'm not so sure. I haven't been thinking about heaven. When you have this hope of God in you, you will think about heaven. I'm not saying you're going to think of it every second of the day, but it's going to come to you. and you're going to, you, you know what happens when it comes to you? When you think about the hope of heaven, you begin to break down. You begin to be broken inside. And you realize the gift that God has given you, I'm unworthy of it. And it causes you to cry. Or it causes you to worship. It causes you to be grateful. It causes you to say thank you. One of the other reactions will take place when you begin to think about your eternal home, your eternal dwelling, when you begin to think on the things of God. You got, you got hope, amen? You got a hope. See, when men do not think on things above, they're bound to the ways of the earth. They're captive. They're slaves. Don't let anyone fool you that goes about a merry life as everything's okay, especially those who walked away from the faith and it looks like they're having a great old time. They're bound. They're slaves under the devil's dominion. And there is no hope. There's a partial hope. There is a temporary hope that the devil gives them to keep them happy and long enough so that he can deceive them long enough to lose their soul. That's what he does. But not our God. Our God doesn't pull us around with strings and false hopes. Our God doesn't do that. Amen? Our God gives us assurance. Our God gives us stability. Our God gives us concrete confidence in His Word. I'm here convinced. For by this hope you're saved. You're saved by this hope, ladies and gentlemen. While everybody else is thinking about the pleasures and comforts and riches of this world, yes, God will give those things to you because our God is good to us. But the man or woman of God is focused on the greater. They're focused on that. And that motivates them to make decisions based on what is more important to God. His specific will will be performed and you will choose the things of God above the things of the world and above the things of your own flesh. You will do it because the Spirit of God is in you and you are captivated by the greatness of this hope. And you say, you know what? It's not worth doing that. It's not worth being part of this. It's not worth me getting this. Because you know what? It's a, it may be detrimental to my soul. You see, when storms hit the man that is earthbound, they're on, they're shaken. There's no stability. They're unable to look to the Lord. There's no hope held out. Isn't it wonderful that God has given you hope to hold on to? Isn't it wonderful that you can share the hope that you have in Christ to that unstable soul who may be lost for all eternity? That God may use you to speak hope, the hope of Christ, the word of God into their life. Think, it's better to build for God than to build your life upon this world. Jesus said, he said a foolish man built his house upon sand, the sand representing the world and the things of this world. There's no stability. And then he says, and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and it fell with a great crash. It was sad. It's sad. It's sad. It's so sad. Since 1988, the Lord has kept me in his house. Notice I said the Lord not my righteousness, not because I'm a pastor, not because I've been a goody two-shoes for 20 plus years. No, because of the greatness of God. He's kept me, and if he's kept me, he'll keep you. And there's been so many times I could have went back to the world, so many temptations, so many, that the Lord has bailed me out of them each and every time. People may say it's so boring in the house of God. No, it's not. It's boring because your heart is in the world. It's boring because your 
your heart is in that world. And there's no hope in that world now, the hope that God gives. According to Jesus, the foolish man was building on sand the world of instant gratification. What is more important in life today? That's what I'm going to look to. That's what I'm going to see. That's what I'm... And, men, and men run after these things. Jesus says the pagans run after those things. Don't be like them. Your heavenly father knows what you need and he will give it to you. He will take care. The pagans do this. They run, 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 run. And seek, 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 and look and take and grab. And they'll step over people. They'll destroy people's lives. But not the kingdom of God. Not God's people. They don't do that. They wait on the Lord. They wait on the Lord. They have grown patient. Amen. That's what they do. Paul says these things in 2 Corinthians is that the things which are seen are temporal. Everything that is seen is temporal. As we used to say in the Christian camp, when we all had problems and things were looking out of whack in our lives, there's a famous saying in the Christian culture, this too shall pass. It's going to pass. Just hold on, brother. Hold on, sister. Hold on to what? Your goodness, your own righteousness, or Christ? Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to the word. Hold on to the hope that you have in eternity. The God of our salvation. The God who saved us and made us new and whole as a home in heaven. And we're going to be there complete with God. Complete with God. In the context of the verses that we read, just to stay in the context of the verse, the temporal, right, that Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians, that's in 2 Corinthians. And matter of fact, let me finish what else he says about the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So those things we cannot see are eternal. The naked eye cannot see the eternity of God, the kingdom of God. In heaven, the kingdom of God dwells within us by faith. God is his kingdom. God is the kingdom. But heaven, heaven, where the new Jerusalem, where we're going to inhabit with God, we have not seen yet. We read about it in the book of Revelation, how beautiful it's going to be. He has trees there with the healing of the nations in those leaves. I mean, it's going to be a fabulous, wonderful place that not even King Solomon can build anything close to what God has built. Not even Bill Gates, not even uh, the greatest architect in the world can build anything compared to what God has built. Nothing. Nothing. And so Paul the Apostle says that we have this hope. And by that hope, it says we are saved. And listen to this, verse 24. But hope that is seen is no hope. If you see the things you're hoping for, there is no hope. But we have hope because we haven't seen it yet. Amen? We're anticipating. We're waiting. Waiting patiently. Get used to learning how to wait, brothers. Sisters, get used to learning how to wait. Oh, yes, my brother and sister, please learn that when God works with you, he's going to teach you to wait. It's good. It builds character. And it teaches you to hold on to God and lean on him and not your own understanding. When you learn to wait on God, you learn to wait on his wisdom, on his will, on his way, because it's best. Right? It's better. When you wait on God, it's better. Let me tell you what Charles Spurgeon said about hope. Hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. Did you hear that? Should I read it again? Because it's so beautiful the way Spurgeon wrote. In regards to hope. You see, our hope always is mundane and earthly. It is. Let's be honest. We, we, we do get some hope out of the things we want to do in life. And, but it only satisfies for a little bit. Always. You always come up empty after you feel that. that. But it, it fades away after you get it. It's like people get a new car. And about a month later, they're looking at a Tesla or something. You know, they want a better car. Right? They got a Mercedes, but now they want a Tesla. There's no real satisfaction. The hope is quickly gone, right? But, but, but listen to what Spurgeon 
Spurgeon says, hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. You know, let's, let's, let's look at it like this. Our night of adversity is living in the world. Living in this world that is contrary to God is a night of adversity. We're trudging through this world. We're running our race. This is not our home. Is this your home? This is not our home. When it's not your home, you have a hope. If it's your home, then your hope is on the things of the world. So it is difficult right now for some of us. Some of us have gotten sick. Some of us have felt the pains of sickness in our body. As a believer, we have become sick and we say, that in God, we should all be healed and all the time. But sometimes God doesn't heal everybody. And maybe that sickness is for your own good to cause you to trust God, cause you to have faith in Him. Maybe that trial or difficulty or problem that is like a thorn in your side, like Paul the Apostle, it is for your good. Have you ever thought about that? It is for God to uh, mold the uh, image of His Son in you and make you more like Christ Jesus and learn to have hope and wait in the storm. Amen? See, a hope that is seen and those hope at all, He said there in verse 24, but hope that is seen is no hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? You see, we don't see it yet. But we still hope, we have hope, we expect, we have a certainty and an expectation that God is going to grant us what he said he's going to give. He's going to grant it to you. Grant. I love that word. Grant it to you. You didn't do anything. He's going to grant it to you. He's going to, let me give you another word. He's going to bestow it upon you. Isn't it beautiful? Words, when they're defined and when they describe something, God's going to bestow it. I feel like He's going to bestow it. It's just going to pour out onto you from God. That's what He's going to do. He's going to grant it to you. It's certain. It's certain. It's sure. Now, doesn't that remind you of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1? Doesn't it remind you, brothers and sisters, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11 really quick, if we can turn to our Bibles there, and, 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 and I'm going to be closing here in a second, or not a second, but a couple minutes here. Uh, Hebrews, I have it right here, Hebrews, Hebrews, where is it, Hebrews? Hebrews chapter 1, listen to this. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, I'm sorry. Verse 1, 11 verse 1, better said there. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it's the substance of what we hope for is sure, is certain, right? Faith, through faith we accept Christ, by faith we're made righteous, by faith we believe we have a home in heaven, by faith we believe it's substance. It's a guarantee. It's by faith. And we hope and the evidence of things not seen. And then this is verse 2 says, For by it the elders obtain the good report. God's people of the past. Those people that you read about in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ruth. Amen. Right? Esther. Mordecai. They all had that faith. They all had an expectation, brothers and sisters. Moses as well. Moses. Oh my goodness. Moses is a wonderful example of this because Moses had everything he wanted. Had everything. He had riches. He had power. He had the ability to have any woman he wanted. He had all the things a man, the man of the earth dreams of, right? This, that, I had it all. Moses. In Pharaoh's court, right? Second in command, I think it was, that he got from rescue from the Nile. But God had a plan. I want you to notice something about, about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, the same chapter. And I want you to notice in Hebrews chapter 11, right?